uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, and, and I know that geometry here is very broadly interpreted, so I don't, I don't expect you all to be uh, non-Archimedean analytic geometers. <laughs> And so, so I'll explain what, what this, this tropical motivic uh, integration is, but, but the actual integration won't, won't come until the end. And, and if you're a sort of classical, real analytic geometer, uh, I'll, uh, you might, I just want to warn you in advance that the only function that we're going to integrate is the constant function one. So, <laughs> So all, I, all we're trying to do at this point is to compute the volumes of, of certain objects. And, and of course, this theory should also contain within it um, uh, possibilities for integrating more interesting functions. Uh, um, and, and that should, should have valuable applications. But, but for now, um, there are already applications to, to computing volumes. These tropical motivic integrals, the, the values in which these integrals uh, live are, are slightly fancier versions of Euler characteristics. So, so let me start uh, for motivation by, by recalling the basics of, of Euler characteristics. So let's start where x is, say, a finite simplicial complex. And the naive, intuitive way to write down what the Euler characteristic of a finite simplicial complex is, well, we take the alternating sum of the number of faces uh, in, in each dimension. So the good thing about this definition is, is that it's easy to work with. We can compute examples. And the... Uh, What's not immediately obvious is that this is a topological invariant, that it didn't depend on the choice of triangulation of our, of our geometric space. Uh, but of course, it, it is a topological invariant. So it's independent of the triangulation uh, because it's equal to the alternating sum of, of the Betty numbers. And so, so why is it equal to the alternating sum of the Betty numbers, the dimensions of the rational cohomology groups, singular cohomology? So the, the standard proof would, would be a comparison theorem that two different cohomology theories agree. So that there's the... So we have the simplicial chain complex, which computes simplicial cohomology and, and this uh, maps naturally to, to singular, the singular chain complex. And, and the, the proof is just to show that, yes. And, and so, so this, this map of chain complexes is a, is a quasi-isomorphism. And so this is not the, the proof that I, that I want you to have in mind. So what I want to do is, is recall a, a different argument for, for the topological uh, invariance of Euler characteristic that, that I hope will, will motivate and, and, and make clear the, the structure of, of the constructions that, that we want to get to. So since we have a finite simplicial complex, the, the topological space is, is compact. And so that means cohomology with compact supports will be the same as cohomology with closed supports. And so why would I prefer cohomology with compact supports uh, in, in this context. And the, the reason is that excision has a particularly nice formulation for cohomology with, with compact supports. So what does excision say? Uh, so so if we have a, a closed subspace, 
and we look at the open complement U. Then we can build a, a long exact sequence. So if we have a compactly supported class on, on U, we can just include that into, into X, and that will be compactly supported on X. And then we can take the usual restriction from, from X to Y. And then we have a co-boundary map which increases degree uh, by one and, and brings us back to you. So excision tells us that this is exact. So if you have a, a short exact sequence of vector spaces, then the dimension of the middle term is the sum of the dimensions of the outer terms. And more generally, when you have a long exact sequence of, of vector spaces, then the alternating sum of the dimensions is zero. So, so, so if we define a, the compactly supported Euler characteristic of, of a space, to be the alternating sum of the dimensions of the compactly supported cohomology groups. Uh, so then what excision is telling us is that the compactly supported Euler characteristic of a space X, when it decomposes as a closed subspace Y and an open subspace U, that the Euler characteristic is the sum of the compactly supported Euler characteristics of the pieces. So, so this is the point that we have this, this invariant which under suitable hypotheses is additive for disjoint unions. Okay. So how do we get from, from there now to the invariance of the ordinary Euler characteristic well, we said our ordinary Euler characteristic was equal to uh, our compactly supported Euler characteristic for X because X is a finite simplicial complex and hence uh, compact. So returning to X, we want to, so, so to show that the Euler characteristic of X defined as the alternating sum of the numbers of simplices uh, is equal to the compactly supported Euler characteristic of X. So we want to apply excision where the open set is the interior of a maximal cell. And then well, the compactly supported Euler characteristic of an open N cell. Well, an open N cell is homeomorphic to Rn. And the compactly supported cohomology of, of Rn has degree 1 supported in degree N. So so this is minus one to the n. Uh, okay. Okay, and then induct on on the number of simplices. Okay. So what this suggests is that the the invariance of of Euler characteristic is is really a, a manifestation of of excision. And we should be able to take more out of this. So, so, so excision is, is telling us uh, more than, than this, this alternating sum. So, it, so if we wanted to take a slightly more, take a step towards the more interesting Euler characteristics that we're going to compute, one first step would be to take the Grotendieck group of Q vector spaces. So, so we could take the free abelian group on finite dimensional Q vector spaces, and we want to quotient by uh, relations from exact sequences. So, 
So if 0 to v0 to v1, some vm to 0 is exact. So we have some bounded exact sequence of finite dimensional q vector spaces. So then the relation we would impose is that the alternating sum of the classes of these vector spaces is 0. So now we could define the, the compactly supported Euler characteristic of, of x. We could define a sort of slightly fancier version to be the alternating sum of the classes of those cohomology groups. Uh, so in this, in this Grotendi group. And excision would be telling us that, that once again, so even with this fancier version, we still have this additivity. So, so you, you might grumble and, and object at this point that, that I've done absolutely nothing. And, and you'd, be, you'd be, of course, correct that the uh, Groton D group of, of two vector spaces uh, is, is just uh, canonically isomorphic to, to the integers. So I, I, we've, we've done. We've done nothing, but we have, we've done more than, than, well. But we could, we could make this interesting by looking at situations where these compactly supported cohomology groups have just a little bit more structure. So, <coughs> So we could take some, some group G and, and look at a space X that has, has an action of, of this group uh, G. And then we could define the G equivariant compactly supported Euler characteristic of X to be the alternating sum of, of the compactly supported cohomology of X. Um, but now in the Groton D group of G representations. So, so finite dimensional rational representations of this group G uh, modulo exact sequences of, of representations. And so then if we had Y in X closed and G invariant, then you would be open and G invariant and the excision sequence would be an exact sequence of representations of G. And so now excision will tell us that the G equivariant compactly supported Euler characteristic of X is equal to that of Y plus that of U. Okay. And so now this, this Grotendi D group of, of G representations might might be interesting. So now, now we start to get more, more information from this approach. And, and this approach becomes even more interesting if you go to the algebraic setting. So if you look at, at spaces that are defined by, by polynomial equations. So, so take some complex uh, algebraic variety. Uh, and so, so then the, both the cohomology of x and the compactly supported cohomology of x carry some additional structure which remembers the fact that, that x was defined by polynomial equations. Uh, and so this additional structure is, uh, so it's a, a mixed Hodge structure. Um, 
so this was, was explained by, by Deline uh, 45 years ago. Uh, and you could just think of it as the representation of a group. So, so there's a group called the Deline torus, and the Deline torus acts on the cohomology of any algebraic variety. And all natural maps between cohomology groups of varieties that are induced by algebraic maps are uh, equivariant with respect to the action of the Deline torus. And, and so then the, the, same, the same arguments, so excision uh, tells us that the compactly supported cohomology of X uh, in the Grotendi group of mixed Hodge structures uh, is equal to that of Y plus that of U. So whenever Y is a closed uh, subvariety of, of X. Uh, it's the complexification of C star uh, viewed as a real algebraic group. So. And, and the relation of that with the mixed hot structure? Uh, so one of Deline's observations was that the category of mixed hot structures is canonically isomorphic as an abelian category to the category of representations of, of this torus. So you could think of it either way. If you're happy with mixed Hodge structures, then forget about the torus. If you prefer group representations and don't know mixed Hodge structures, there's a group floating around, and this is uh, representations of that group. OK. And so there are various conjectures floating around. Uh, Hodge conjecture, generalized Hodge conjecture, which suggests that whatever this uh, motivic world is that we haven't gotten to yet, that the motivic world should be accurately reflected by, by mixed Hodge structures, that mixed Hodge structures sort of capture all, all motivic information. And there are things other than algebraic varieties whose cohomology carries canonical mixed Hodge structures. So for instance, the Milner fiber of, of, a holomorph of the singularity of a holomorphic function carries a canonical mixed Hodge structure. So that means that the, the Milner fiber should somehow be a motivic object. And the applications that we have so far of, of this tropical motivic integration that we haven't gotten to yet, uh, those applications involve computing uh, the motivic Euler characteristics of, of Milner fibers. So, it's, so the applications are to studies of singularities. Okay, so let's take one step closer to, to motivic constructions. So, so far all of the invariants that we've been interested in were additive with respect to decomposition into a closed part and an open part. So now what we'll do is just define a universal group where that happens, and that's the Grotendi group of varieties. So, so this is a free abelian group on uh, isomorphism classes of algebraic varieties over the complex numbers and uh, modulo relations of the form the class of x is equal to the class of y plus the class of u. Uh, so whenever you have a closed subvariety y, and u is the open complement. And so you could think of excision as telling us that there's a, a map from the Grotendi group of varieties to, say, the Grotendi group of, of mixed Hodge structures. And, and this is more actually, so, so far we've just been talking about these as groups, but this is actually a ring map. Uh, the product here on the left is products of varieties. And the product here is, is tensor product. So if you were thinking about it as representation, so it's tensor product of representations or, or tensor product of, of mixed Hodge structures. And the, the warning, so there's, there's a warning that I have to give, which is that this is a subtle ring. So, so we've defined it quite naively and simply, but
So just so we continue to learn learn new things about about this ring. So just in the last few years, we learned that L, so the class of of the line, so the class of C itself, uh, this is a zero divisor. So, so there's, so th there's some interesting and, and subtle ring that, that we're studying. And why was this ring introduced? Why, why did we, why, do, why do we study this? Um, well, this. So we want to get to some version of motivic integration, and the integrals that we compute in motivic integration, they take values. they take values in, in this group or in this ring. Uh, and sometimes they take values in some completion of this ring or this ring with this class inverted, which is some slightly um, non-trivial thing to do, inverting a zero divisor. Uh, but, but, but in fact, the tropical motivic integration that we'll get to quite honestly takes values in, in this ring without any completions, without any inversions. So this idea of motivic integration, this was, was introduced by, by Kinsevich in the mid-90s. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just remind you what his, his application was. So it was known already that, that if you had two birational uh, Calabi-Yau varieties, uh, then they have the same Betty numbers. So if you have two Calabi-Yau varieties, so two varieties with canonical trivial bundle uh, that have open subvarieties that are isomorphic, then, then in fact they, they have the same Betty numbers. And that can be proved using, uh, using p-adic integration or point counting over finite fields. And Well, so since the cohomology of, of algebraic varieties has this additional structure, this mixed Hodge structure, we want to know that not just the Betty numbers are preserved, but, but the Hodge numbers are preserved. And this is what Kinsevich showed. So he, he showed birational calabi yaus have the same Hodge numbers. So, so, so part of mixed Hodge theory is that HK decomposes into a direct sum of HPQs where P plus Q is equal to K and the dimensions of those HPQs are, are these Hodge numbers. Okay, so, so all, the, all the interesting applications of, of this Grotendi group can be understood as, well, motivic integration plus, um, plus or the Grotendi group of varieties plus weak factorization of, of birational maps. So there's some algebraic surgery uh, theory that allows you to compare birational varieties and keep track of these invariants. So now I've at least said a couple words about motivic integration, and, and what I haven't said anything about yet is, is this word tropical that, that comes in front of it. Uh, whatever, whatever tropical geometry is, it involves uh, associating finite polyhedral objects to, to algebraic varieties. And so the so tropical motivic integration is going to involve this Grotendi group group of, of varieties, but, it, but it's also going, going to involve some sort of scissors congruence on, on polyhedra. And so let me remind you uh, that, that we can also do, do similar constructions to what we did with varieties uh, in the polyhedral setting. So, so there's this group, uh, which I'll call K0 of Q. So, so this is a scissors group of rational polyhedra. And so one, one way to explain what this is would be to talk about what, what the constructible sets are in the, in the theory of rational polyhedra. So the constructible sets will be uh, finite uh, Boolean combinations of 
of rational polyhedra. And so, so if you've thought about the scissors group in dimension three and the Dane invariant and such, so this is, it's, these polyhedra are, can be unbounded, so, so in this K0Q, so it's a slightly different but, but closely related um, uh, scissors group. And so, we'll, and then, so we'll take some free abelian group on constructible sets, uh, and the relations are from constructible bijections. So, and now a constructible bijection, so it's just a map between two polyhedra, you could then take the, the graph of that map and ask that it be constructible. So, so, uh, so um, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so and, I, and I guess my, my caution here, uh, again, should be that, that whatever this, this ring K0 of Q is, it, it should be subtle. Okay, and, and so. So, so there's a long history of, of studying uh, polyhedra up to constructible bijection. It goes back to Hilbert's third problem, which asked whether the uh, unit cube could be cut into pieces, uh, polyhedral pieces, and reassembled uh, to form the uh, regular tetrahedron of, of unit volume. And so the answer is no, and the solution was given by Dane, uh, and, and Dane's invariant uh, lives in uh, some really um, wild uh, infinite dimensional vector space uh, R tensored over Z with R mod two pi. Uh, but it, it is, it's, it's an easy invariant to compute. Uh, and, and I think this gives a very, so now we've, so this gives a second incarnation of, you know, how do we study these abstract Grotin D groups? Well, we find interesting maps to rings that we can understand. So how do we understand the Grotin D group of varieties? Well, we map to something like a Grotin D group of mixed Hodge structures. How do we understand a Grotin D group of polyhedra? Well, we map to something that's somewhat more understandable, like, like Dane's invariant. Okay, so, so I don't think this group is actually well understood. Uh, and so, there's, so, so here's you know, one open area that's sort of, I think, quite unexplored and, and welcoming for research. So what is, what are interesting invariants of this group K0 of Q? Uh, so, um, what? Yes. Yes, that's right. So, so I, I say this for inspiration. That's right. And Dane's invariant, so when Dane is, is disassembling and reassembling these pieces, he doesn't care about how the faces overlap. And we do care about how the faces overlap. We care about the contributions of lower dimensional pieces. So, so this really is, it's a different setup, um, but I think with Dane's invariant in mind, we should expect that there are subtle and non-trivial invariants uh, on K0Q. That's, so, so I agree that there's no mathematical statement uh, being made, just, just motivation. Okay, so in order to, to go from um, from what we've, what we've said so far about Grotin D groups of varieties and Grotin D groups of polyhedra to, to some version of, of motivic integration, uh, we're going to go through a geometric theory that, that I expect to be unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, but I, so I, I know there's people out there who, who have seen this before, but okay, so semi-algebraic geometry, um, what? So it's, so in algebraic geometry, we define our sets using polynomial equations. We set things equal to zero. In semi-algebraic geometry, we work over a field with an additional structure, evaluation. So something like a field of power series. We have evaluation on that field. 
And we look at sets that are defined by polynomial equations and inequalities on the valuation or inequalities on, on the associated uh, non-Archimedean norm. Uh, so I'm only going to work over, over one field today uh, for, for concreteness. Uh, so this is the field of Puiseux series. It's the union over all n of formal Laurent series in nth roots of a parameter t. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the algebraic closure of the completion of the function field of of, of a line. So okay, so it is it is algebraically closed, which is important. Uh, so there's evaluation from the non-zero elements of this field to the rational numbers. And you should think of this valuation as being order of vanishing at t equals zero. And this will take on rational values because we have rational powers of t. So, so if we have some constant times some power of t plus some higher order terms, so terms that have higher, higher powers of t and ca is not zero, uh, then uh, the valuation is A, so the exponent of, of the leading term. So for, for this theory, I should tell you what the constructible sets are. What, are, what, are the, what sets will we study? So a, so a subset of k to the n is uh, semi-algebraic if it is a finite Boolean combination of sets of the form um, x such that valuation of f of x is greater than or equal to the valuation of g of x where f and g are, are polynomials. So there's still something algebraic here. So the inequalities on valuations are, are only imposed on, on polynomial functions. Uh, and here I should probably say that the valuation of 0 is, is just defined to be infinity. Okay, so now you can talk about a function vanishing by saying that the valuation of f of x is greater than or equal to the valuation of the function 0. There's one other uh, piece of structure that I want you to have in mind here is that so inside any field with evaluation, we have a special ring, the valuation ring. Uh, so this is everything with non-negative valuation and, and the zero element. So, so this is a, a subring. So you should think of this as just being a power series in T with non-negative powers of T, so, so no poles. And so if we have um, a power series with no poles, then we can take the coefficient of the constant term. So we have a specialization map from uh, r or r to the n to c to the n. And so, so c0 plus c a t to the a and so on. So this just maps to, to the constant term c0. So, so let me give some examples of, of semi-algebraic sets. So one example is just take an algebraic subvariety. So, so those are semi-algebraic. 
We could also build interesting semi-algebraic sets out of subvarieties over the complex numbers. So if z inside cn is a variety or a constructible algebraic set, then the preimage under specialization of z uh, is semi-algebraic. So, so that's one part that, that comes from uh, complex varieties. Uh, there's another part that comes from polyhedral geometry. So if we look at a constructible subset of QN, then so the, so, uh, the tropicalization map in this context is just coordinate-wise valuation. So if we have an n-tuple of elements of our field, then we can take coordinate-wise valuation, we get something in Qn. And so we can take the preimage of our constructible set uh, in Kn, or k star to the n. Uh, this is semi-algebraic. Okay, so uh, now the these semi-algebraic sets actually form a nice geometric category. So, you, so what are the maps between semi-algebraic sets? So you have two subsets of Kn. So if you have a set map between them, then the graph of that map is a subset of Km plus n. And you could ask whether that, that subset is constructible. So the semi-algebraic maps are the set theoretic maps with constructible graphs. And now you could talk about uh, constructible bijections, and you could build uh, a nice Grotendieck d group. So, so hopefully this thought has, has already occurred to you, that there's, ah, that there's a Grotendieck d group. Uh, and so, the, uh, so what's the notation here? So, so I've been saying finite Boolean combination, constructible set, and, and all of that is an, an indication that the model theorists uh, have, have been at work uh, in this subject. And so the notation for the Groton D group of semi-algebraic sets is K0 VFK. So the Groton D group of the first order theory of valued fields. Uh, so, so this is a free abelian group on semi-algebraic sets or isomorphism classes of semi-algebraic sets modulo uh, modulo relations uh, given by semi-algebraic bijections to disjoint unions. So when x is in semi-algebraic bijection with the disjoint union of y and u. Now, any, any, yeah. So y has to be semi-algebraic, u has to be semi-algebraic, but, but that's it, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's one wonderful theorem about, so, so, uh, K0 VF, we, we don't understand it, but we understand how it relates to two other things that we don't understand. <laughs> so, so this is a, a beautiful theorem of Ruszowski uh, and Kajdan. Uh, so this is from a little over uh, a decade ago. Uh, and what, what they tell us is is the following. So, uh, so the Grotendieck group of valued fields is uh, canonically isomorphic to, okay, so, so there's a Grotendieck group of varieties over, over C, so the part that comes from the residue field. And, and then there's a graded twist of this, so I'll, I'll say in a moment what this is. Uh, and this is tensored as a graded wing, ring with a graded twist of the Grotendieck group of rational polyhedra. Um, and then 
modulo two easy relations. So there's two natural expressions for the class of, of GM, the multiplicative group, and there's two natural expressions for the class of the unit ball. So what does this, this grading mean? So K0 varieties graded. So this is the direct sum over all N of the Grotendieck group of varieties over C of dimension less than or equal to N. Okay, so you could just look at the free abelian group on varieties of dimension less than or equal to N modulo the relations that hold on those varieties. Take a direct sum over all N, that gives you these graded pieces. This is a graded tensor product. And the relations are not homogeneous. And so this quotient does not have a grading. So there's no secret grading on the Grotendieck group of semi-algebraic sets, but there it is. And so what's good about this theorem, what's so wonderful about this theorem is that if you're looking for interesting invariants of this Grotendieck ring of valued fields, well, you look at all the interesting invariants that you know on the Grotendieck ring of varieties. Um, so far, we only have a small class of interesting invariants here, but, but you use the ones that you have and you, and you put them together and in any way that satisfies these two easy relations. And then that will give you uh, an invariant on semi-algebraic sets. So there's one invariant in particular that, that we've been quite interested in and it is called volume. Um, Okay, so, so there is a unique uh, map, which is called volume, and it takes the Grotendieck ring of, of semi-algebraic sets uh, to the Grotendieck ring of, of varieties, and is characterized by the following two properties. Um, so the volume of This semi-algebraic set, so power series that specialize into some subvariety Z of Cn. Uh, so that should be Z. And the volume of the preimage under tropicalization of some constructible polyhedral set gamma. Uh, so this is uh, chi prime of gamma times n copies of the multiplicative group. And here, uh, so, so for any, so chi prime is characterized by the property that chi prime of P is one for every closed polyhedron P. Uh, okay, so it's not quite a topological Euler characteristic or a compactly supported Euler characteristic, but, uh, but it, behaves a bit like compactly supported Euler characteristics. So chi prime of an open bounded polyhedron uh, P is minus one to the dimension of P. Um, chi prime of an open unbounded polyhedron is zero. So that's, that's the difference. Okay. So the types of theorems that one wants to, to prove in order to give meaning and weight to this theory uh, are, are of two flavors. Uh, one is that given some invariant that you're interested in, there exists a semi-algebraic set whose volume computes that invariant. And the other type of theorem you want to prove is that we can compute this volume. Uh, so we have theorems of, of both flavors. Uh, so I'll mention the first one. So uh, let me uh, state it uh, this way. So let F uh, so be uh, a holomorphic map. So from um, 
from a variety x to, to c, uh, and choose, choose a point in, in the hypersurface where, where f vanishes. Uh, and then there is a natural uh, semi-algebraic set um, psi fx um, whose class in the Grotendi group of semi-algebraic sets, if we take its volume, uh, so this is the motivic Milner fiber. And so, so in particular from this, uh, so this specializes to the uh, Euler characteristic of the Milner fiber. in the Grotendi group of mixed Hodge structures. So, so if you're interested in Milner fibers and invariants of Milner fibers, there is this canonical semi-algebraic set which carries, uh, which carries quite a lot of, of information. Is this a local invariant at the point x? Yes. Yes, a local invariant of the singularity of the whole morphic map uh, f. There's also a version of this for the nearby fiber, which is something built out of all Milner fibers at all points on, on the hypersurface. Okay, uh, so, so, this is, so this is one of the, the results from, from my work with, with Johannes. And our, our second result says that it gives us a method of, of computing of computing these volumes. So maybe I should, should remind you, uh, so this is a Fubini theorem. And so I should remind you sort of a Fubini theorem that, that you teach in, in calculus. Uh, so say you have some nice subset of R2, and nice here probably means measurable. And so uh, maybe bounded. So it has some volume. And so then you could look at, it, at the function, which takes a point on R and computes uh, the volume of its intersection with, with the set S. So, so then the function x goes to the volume so on R uh, of S. Uh, intersected with the preimage of x under projection, uh, so this is measurable, and the volume of s is equal to the integral of well this function vol of s intersect by inverse of x. Well, with respect to the measure on the real line. So you can compute the volume of the set S by computing the volumes of all of the fibers and integrating. So there's, there's your uh, Fubini theorem. And so we want to have a Fubini theorem, but now this is for the tropicalization map. Uh, and so that's, that's what we have. So, so we take a semi-algebraic uh, subset of a torus and We could look at the volumes of fibers, so the push forward of the constant function one on the set X. So this is a map from uh, QN to K0 of varieties over C, and this takes a point W to the volume of top inverse of W intersected with X. So then our, our theorem has, has two parts, uh, as, as you would expect. So the first part is that this push forward uh, is constructible. And here that means that it is constant with respect to a decomposition of Q to the N into finitely many constructible sets. 
So this function takes finitely many values on, on constructible sets. Uh, and, and the volume of x is the integral of this function with respect to Euler characteristic on, on the polyhedral constructible sets. So we, we have two main applications uh, of, of this Fubini theorem. Uh, one is, is a short proof of the uh, integral identity conjecture of Kinsevich and Soibelman. So both of the applications are proofs of conjectured formulas on Euler characteristics of Milner fibers that showed up in Motivic, Donald's, and Thomas theory. So, uh, so there is this, this theory for counting curves that makes various predictions. And in order for this theory to have the structure that it is conjectured to have, such as a change of variables formula, then certain identities have to hold for, for certain um, classes or, mo or motivic Milner fibers. And we can prove those conjectures by, by expressing those invariants as volumes of semi-algebraic sets and applying Fubini theorems to those semi-algebraic sets. So one application is this integral identity conjecture of Kinsevich and Sleubelman, uh, which is a little more complicated to state. And so let me uh, state instead the other application, which is the proof of a conjecture of Davison and Meinhardt. Um, in special cases of this conjecture were proved by uh, uh, Kai Baron, Jim Bryan, and Bala uh, And uh, so, So, so the published version of this conjecture is, is by Davison and Meinhardt. There's versions of this conjecture uh, due to Dominic Joyce. Uh, okay, but let me just state what the, uh, what the conjecture is. So the conjecture is about the Milner fiber uh, uh, of a, uh, or the nearby fiber of a quasi-homogeneous singularity. So, So we have a function that's quasi-homogeneous of degree d. So this means degree d, but where the variables have weights. So this is with respect to weights w1 through wn. And the conjecture was that the motivic nearby fiber uh, is the class of the general fiber. Okay, so, so there's some, uh, yeah. So th this nearby fiber, again, just it encodes all of, all of the Milner fibers. So all of the Milner fibers at every point of a quasi-homogeneous hypersurface, all of those put together, uh, the, the conjecture is that, is that um, you just get the general fiber and the hard part of proving this conjecture, so there are explicit formulas for this motivic nearby fiber, and those explicit formulas are given in terms of a resolution of singularities. So if you knew a canonical, nice way of resolving the singularities of an arbitrary quasi-homogeneous singularity without taking into account information about the coefficients, then you would get a nice formula. And, and the fact is that no one knows how to do that um, we don't know how to do that, um, and, and it's probably just not, not possible. So, so how does this tropical motivic Fubini theorem get you past that? Uh, let me sketch the proof. And uh, so let uh, so we have these weights, and we have this degree, and so we make this 
We just divide the weights by the degree, and that gives us a point uh, W. And then we, we construct a set X, so it's semi-algebraic. Uh, so with the following properties. OK, so there's some cone-shaped decomposition of, of Rn, so decomposition into cones centered at W, uh, so such that uh, the volume of trop inverse of, of V intersected with X is constant on cones um, with vertex W. So now intersected with uh, with the orthant. So so we have these pieces, and we intersect them with the orthant. And so this sort of on this open cone together with this closed part, the volume is constant. And on this open cone, the volume is constant. And the other thing that we know is that the volume of chop inverse of W plus uh, the orthant is what we're interested in. So, so we have this piece, which is W plus the orthant, and the volume of that part is the expected value. And then we need to show that the volume of the rest is zero. The difficulty is the same difficulty that everyone else ran into. We don't know how to compute the volumes of the fibers over points outside of this part. Okay, so computing the, the volumes of those pieces would be essentially equivalent to resolving the singularities and, and applying the standard formula. What we know is that when you take an open cone and put in the closed part at the end, well, this is an open n cell union an open n minus 1 cell. So chi prime of this is 0. So the reason why we can compute these integrals is because of the d chi prime. So, so the pieces in the formula that we don't understand uh, show up with coefficient 0. Okay, so, uh, and, and that's the same reason why we're, we're able to prove the, the integral identity conjecture of Kinsevich and Soibelman. It's a different construction. But once again, there's some polyhedral piece with Euler characteristic zero that kills the terms that nobody knows how to control. Okay, so let, let me stop there. <laughs>